Elizabeth's full time of being delivered was come, and she brought forth a son. Words taken from the gospel for this nativity of St. John the Baptist. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Once a father and his son went into the neighbor's cornfield. The father had his son sit on the edge and look back and forth to make sure no one was coming as he pinched a few ears of corn. The father would say to the son, Son, is anyone there? Anyone coming? Anyone to the left? Anyone to the right? No, Dad. But then he said, Dad, shouldn't we be looking up? There's eyes in heaven looking down. Can see all we do. This is what St. John the Baptist does. He points up. He teaches us to look up and realize the presence of those eyes always looking upon us. The church's liturgical calendar has three nativities a year. The birth of our Lord on December 25th, when the light of the sun is just beginning to wax. It's getting more light. Then we have the birth of Our Lady, of course, September 8th, and the birth of St. John the Baptist today, June 24th, when the light is just beginning to wane. Now it's starting to get shorter days. He must increase and I must decrease was the motto of St. John the Baptist. The church normally considers the death of a saint to be their birthday into heaven. And that is why we honor and recall the death day of various saints, including, of course, our Lord, Good Friday, and his blessed mother, August 15, she assumed into heaven, and St. John the Baptist, August 29th, the beheading. But we honor in a solemn and special way the physical birth of only three, the last three, because they were born without any original sin, without any sin at all. They were born without sin. As we heard in the introit and the lesson, as well as the gradual today for this Mass, the Lord has called me by name from the womb of my mother. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Today's feast gives us an opportunity to see a basic pattern in God's divine plan. This pattern can be expressed in theological terms simply as grace builds on nature. Grace builds on nature. Meaning that the supernatural always presupposes the existence of the natural and builds upon it and perfects it. Logically, The more perfect our nature, the more perfect it is, the greater will be the supernatural edifice that God can build upon it. The more damaged our nature, here I am speaking in a moral sense, not physical, not about broken limbs or missing parts, but sin, damage to our soul caused by sin. So the more damaged our nature in this moral sense, then the more spotty, the more delicate and fragile will be the supernatural edifice. Our faults and bad habits act like holes in our human nature that easily remain in place at the elevation, at baptism or at a confession. They need to be plugged up. They need to be filled in lest we fall back into them again and again and again and keep sinning. And grace, we need to fill them up because grace will have less to work on. The more they're filled, the more grace has something to work on. In general, then, the earlier an individual is elevated into the supernatural life, the better. This is one reason why infant baptism is so very important, such that the church instructs us to have it done within a couple of weeks of birth. I was baptized, thank God, thank you, my mom and dad, seven days after I was born. What is more, the church has a prayer for blessing the mother and her offspring, even while still in the womb, in utero. And it reads in part, you can see the importance of what I'm saying. 
O Lord God, creator of all things, who by the co-working of the Holy Ghost didst prepare the body and soul of the glorious Virgin Mary to become a worthy home for thy son, who didst fill John the Baptist with the Holy Ghost, making him leap with joy in his mother's womb. Receive the sacrifice of the contrite heart and ardent desire of thy servant, the mother with child, who humbly asks thee for the welfare of the child which thou didst grant her to conceive. Guard the work which is thine and defend it from all the deceit and harm of our bitter enemy, so that the hand of thy mercy may assist her delivery and her child may come to the light of day without harm. Be kept safe for the holy birth of baptism. Serve thee always in all things and attain to everlasting life. The church even wants to bless the child before it's born to make it like it, as it were, another John the Baptist, that it would receive even graces there before baptism. This is important. The sooner God gets his grace working in our souls, in our bodies, in our life, the better. That's the point. Now, on the other hand, this puts a damper on the idea of becoming a prodigal son before getting serious about a holy life, about living a holy life. In other words, those who want to cut loose, to go out and sin for a time, to enjoy the world and all it has to offer, will only further damage their fallen nature and deepen the holes and faults such that the repair of such things will not easily come even after entering back into the church and receiving her sacraments. How many think in this way when raising kids and their teenagers, ah, oh, let them live a little. Well, that's the way it is. He's got to sow his wild oats. Yep. He's damaging his nature worse and worse, more and more. Harder to recover from. Sinful habits harden the heart and produce stone-like pathways, difficult to dig up and turn into fertile ground. Now, this is one of the reasons God starts early with his greatest saints, because they have great things to do. They need strong and sturdy spiritual edifices to carry out his plan. Thus, he started with Our Lady, the mother of the Savior, at the instant of her conception, not even allowing sin to touch her immaculate soul. She was created in a state of grace, created on the supernatural plane, and ever remained there. This is why she is the immaculate conception, the highest honor of our race. This is why St. Augustine said of her, when there is talk of sin... I absolutely do not want Mary involved. Thank you, St. Augustine. Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda, in her beautiful work, The Mystical City of God, has all creation being recapitulated in Blessed Mary at the very start of her life in this world. Why is that? It's mysterious, but why is that? To perfect, to perfect her nature. There was no leakage in the mother of God, no holes, no faults. She was a fountain sealed, a fountain sealed. All the grace that went into her, it never leaked out. Then comes St. Joseph, our beloved St. Joseph, who without doubt was cleansed in the womb very soon after being conceived. Then comes today's saint, John the Baptist, the first fruits of Jesus and Mary. He is elevated while in the womb six months. And this is a doctrine of the church being contained in her magisterial teachings. And that is why we have this feast. To take note of this fact, as the lesson from Isaiah indicates, that the Lord formed me from the womb to be his servant. He sanctified me in the womb. The fathers even speak of St. John being raised to a state of reason. Not just grace, but reason. In other words, he was aware. St. Ambrose talks about this and others. 
He was aware in the womb and he underwent a sort of three month training period, a novitiate under the direction of his majesty, Jesus Christ present in the womb of his mother. So there were two moms and two babies and they were all working together and aware and awake. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? Even though he was cleansed so early, St. John nevertheless worked hard to contain and perfect his human nature, to corral his powerful appetites by going out into the desert for over 20 years, eating wild things, wearing animal skins, and so on. He prepared himself for the role God had designated for him, for maximum cooperation of nature with grace. This is important because it enabled him to love and serve the Lord and others without any self-love and self-preservation getting in the way. Self-preservation is a powerful instinct. This is something that St. John overcame. And so he was able to do some amazing things. First of all, he could stand in the water of the Jordan all day long while hearing confessions and baptizing says it right at the beginning of Mark's gospel. And all Jerusalem, Judea, and the whole surrounding country came to him. Can you imagine standing in water all day? What would your feet look like? St. John, not a problem. He also had to look up. He taught everybody to look up. And that's how come they were looking for the Christ after they met St. John. So his finger is pointing up in the statue. He had people look up. Remember the story? Dad, shouldn't we be looking up? That was St. John. And so he could recognize the Lord definitively when he came and point him out to others. Behold the Lamb of God. In a way, folks, the bells at Mass, every time you hear the bells, it's St. John. Get ready to look up. He's telling us, wake up. Look up. You don't want to miss the Christ. He's coming. And so when you hear the bells, remember St. John. And finally, he could stand up to the Pharisees, the elders, the scribes who held so much power and authority. He could stand up to King Herod even unto death. He was able to do this because his nature was perfected by grace with his complete cooperation. Are we cooperating with God's grace to overcome ourselves? Are we willing to do the penances needed to deny ourselves everything we want? There are two elements in the spiritual life of grace. There's the mystical element. Everybody likes that element. But there's also the ascetical element. That's where we have to do penance and mortification. They go together. It's the cross. You cannot have one without the other. Anybody who's a mystic without penance, I wonder where their mysticism is coming from. I doubt very much it's coming from above. It's probably coming from below. They're both needed for going up to God. In theology, we learn that there are two functions of grace that we receive in the sacraments. There's the gratia elevans, the grace that elevates. When you're baptized, you're elevated. But there's also the gratia sanans, the grace that heals. They go together. You get elevating grace and you get healing grace when you receive the sacraments. The elevating grace lifts us up into the supernatural. But the healing graces are meant for the healing of our nature, for the filling in of those holes that we have. These are given to us most especially in confession and holy communion to heal our broken nature so that it can receive the elevating graces to be raised up in every part of our nature. Are we cooperating with these healing graces so that we can look up with St. John? You know, we do not feel them. Gratia sanans, the healing graces, as we feel the elevating grace. Often we feel those elevating graces, but we do not feel the healing graces. This is why people will go to communion and say, I don't feel anything happening. It's there. You must cooperate with those healing graces 
And then someday God will elevate you higher. You'll be a mystic or something. St. John did cooperate and great things happened. He shares the same nature we have. He's not some kind of a different being. He was human. If he can do it, so can we. As David says in the Psalms, I give you thanks that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's work at overcoming our selfishness and self-love so that this wonderful nature God gave us can be elevated completely unto life eternal. How? Strive to do the opposite of your natural inclinations. If my nature wants to go left, then go right. If it wants to go right, then go left. If it wants to flee, stay put. If it wants to stay, run. Grace builds on nature and it requires we fix the natural part before it can elevate, be elevated completely. But grace, that is gratia sanans, healing graces, will help us if we're willing. It will help us heal. That's what we need. For God always wants to elevate. He wants to supernaturalize everything so that all can be meritorious and pleasing to Him. To do this well, we have to start at home overcoming ourselves, bringing our nature under control, subjecting it to reason through penance and mortification like St. John did so well. Then the rest will follow. The selfishness of a St. John will be produced. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.